So things are a little bit different um, today than what we had maybe originally planned. Uh, thank you, Mike, for jumping in and leading our worship. Taika, our worship ministry director, uh, is in the hospital. She's having her gallbladder removed as we speak. So keep Taika in your prayers. This came up kind of last minute. Mike was planning on being back up, but uh, he, got, uh, he, he got in. So thank you, Mike, for uh, leading our worship. If I sound like I got a frog stuck in my throat, I don't, but, uh, you know, Florida allergies, uh, they seem to hit around the month of February, and so uh, they, they've hit me. Uh, I, I knew I didn't, I started feeling something, and then one day this week, I went out, and my car had the yellow haze on it, and I thought, ah, that's why I'm sounding like I sound, so uh, hopefully... Uh, I'll get through this and won't have to uh, stop and, uh, and take a break or anything. We should be, should be good. Well, uh, Elvis Presley, perhaps, of course, was the greatest rock and roller in history. And he died at the young age of just 42 years old. Now, in spite of enormous success, Elvis was, according to friends, a very unfulfilled and unhappy man. In an interview with his wife, Priscilla, she said this about her husband after he had passed. She said, Elvis never came to terms with who he was meant to be or what his purpose in life was. He thought he was here for a reason, maybe to preach, maybe to serve, maybe to save, maybe to care for people. And that agonizing desire was always with him. And he knew he wasn't fulfilling it. So he'd go on stage and he wouldn't have to think about it. Elvis Presley apparently didn't have a clue where to begin to look for his real purpose in life, his role in this world. And so in a sense, he was lost. Well, we continue today in this series of messages we're in called Standing in the Gap. We've been discussing how God's people must stand in this gap in a country that is divided like never before. So let's do a quick review of this series that began two weeks ago. Two weeks ago, we spoke about the singular purpose for each of our lives. And that is to live in such a way that we shine a spotlight on God and his goodness. That everything we do and everything we say is done in such a way that it draws people's attention to God. It's a God is a good God because I see that in these people. That's our purpose. That's our singular purpose. We, we may not always do that well. And there are times where God's people put a kind of a bad name on God. But that's the goal. God has called us to live in such a way that people see his goodness reflected in our words and in our actions. Last week, we got a little bit more specific and we talked about our calling those things to which God calls us or invites us or commands us each to be and to do. And we noticed how it began with the call to a personal act of relationship with him, where we are aware of his presence in our life. And then it continues with the call to live a distinct life. And the call to share the message of reconciliation. And we finished up with the call to endure and be faithful to the very end of our time on earth. That our walk with God is certainly not a sprint, it's a marathon. Well, today I want to get a little bit more specific. How do we discover the specific roles that God wants us to individually accomplish in his plan for redeeming humanity. Most of us are familiar with Jeremiah 29. It's a favorite verse of many of us. It says this, for I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, and they are plans for good and not for disaster, to give you a future and a hope. Now, that's a wonderful promise. God knows the plans that he has for each of us. God has a plan for each of us. But how do we discover or figure out what those plans are? You know, throughout history, God has called individuals to specific roles to fulfill his plan. In the Bible, many of these individuals heard God's voice and his directions were very, very clear. 
And God still assigns tasks to every believer in every generation, although we likely won't hear those directions as audibly as some in the Bible did. They may not get us mentioned in the pages of the Bible or the annals of history, but the roles to which God calls each of us are still vital to God's plan. When I moved here to Titusville almost five and a half years ago now, I, I didn't hear God say to me audibly, I want you to go to Titusville, Florida. Now, through mutual acquaintances, I learned about this opportunity here at First Christian Church. And I was wanting and thinking about wanting to make a move to Florida, so I sent my resume to the search team. I did my own research on the church and the community. The search team responded to my resume, and they did research on me. I began praying for God's will in this matter, and so did the search team. And eventually, both FCC search team and Susie and I felt this would be a good move. The congregation, you confirmed that in a positive vote, so I came. But I never heard God tell me, go to Titusville. I'm kind of like, I think, Rahab in the Old Testament. Rahab had a specific role that God wanted her to play in saving Israel from their enemies. But Scripture gives us no indication that God ever audibly instructed her regarding what she should do. She just found herself in a very difficult situation, and she chose to do the right thing. And it led to a very important victory for the people of God. And that's kind of the way it's worked in my life. So how do we determine what, if any, specific tasks God has called us to accomplish for his glory? Is there a way to know specifically what is it that God wants us to do or invest our lives in? Well, I jotted down six questions uh, that I often ask that have guided me over the years in determining where and how God has called me to serve him. And the first question is this, what is God passionate about? What is God passionate about? See, whenever I am involved in ministry or work that, that blesses the people that God is most passionate about, then I know that I am doing the right things. What is God passionate about? Well, we know God is passionate about people who have yet to hear the message of Jesus in understandable terms. And so God has tasked the church, and we learned last week about sharing the message that God is reconciling all things to himself through Jesus, that he's not counting men's sins against them. And so it's the same message that Jesus commissioned his disciples before his return to heaven. He said, go into the world and make disciples. So any time, any role, any way that you help people in some way to hear the gospel message in understandable terms, you know that you're fulfilling the role God calls you to. And you can't go wrong with that. God is also passionate about the desperate, widows, orphans. Says this right there in James, pure and genuine religion in the sight of God, the Father, means caring for the orphans and the widows in their distress. Any time that you do something, any time you commit time, involvement, finances, in a way that will bless someone who is in distress, you are doing what God wants you to do. You are fitting in to the plan God has for your life. You never go wrong when you are caring for the people God is most passionate about. That's why I love our ministry in India, where through generous donations like folks from you, we operate a trade school for at-risk ladies, where they're taught a trade so they can financially support themselves and their children. We also operate two homes for disadvantaged and orphaned children with over 70 kids between these two homes. God never told me to get involved with this. I didn't hear an audible voice, but I knew God is passionate about the desperate. God is passionate about widows and orphans. So I figured this would be a good thing to get involved in. So any way that you can bless 
people who are you know, marginalized, people who are in, in, in desperate situations. That's a good thing. We also know God is passionate about the poor and those in need. We have a couple of families here at First Christian Church who are heavily invested in feeding the homeless and providing care for them in our community. Now, I don't know if they ever heard God audibly tell them to get involved in this type of ministry, but they clearly understood that God is passionate about those on the fringe of society, so they got involved. We can make an extensive list of people that God is passionate about beyond what I just mentioned. But the point is this, when you get involved blessing people groups that God is passionate about, then you know you are fulfilling your role in God's plan. So what is God passionate about? Second question I often ask myself is what am I passionate about? What am I passionate about? Now, obviously, we aren't all passionate about the same type of things. Some believers are passionate about the right to life issues, so they voluntarily get involved in pro-life pregnancy centers in their community. Here at FCC, we have people who are very passionate about the country of Haiti. So here at our church, we heavily support and invest in mission work in Jeremy Haiti, and we take trips there at least prior to COVID, we did. You know, God's given me a passion for the country of India. So for the past 10 years, I've been heavily invested in advancing the gospel and in humanitarian efforts in India. And my passion will show forth. Just one night this week, I came across a television show in which one of the episodes dealt with this Indian couple who meet at a restaurant in Mumbai. They fall in love and somehow they now have to convince her parents to give their blessing to their marriage. In India, that's a cultural thing. You don't get married without the parents' approval and blessings. And so on, and, and I kind of just like perked up when I saw it. I kind of got lit up and like, oh, look, there's scenes from India. Look, I, I've almost kind of seen places like that. And it just stirred my heart. And it's just because I have this passion for India and their culture. And so you, you'll know when you have a passion for something. You know, it's quite likely that God has given you whatever it is you're passionate about. He's given you that passion because he has a plan for you and it involves whatever it is that you're passionate about. My oldest sister is very passionate about four-legged friends. And so she volunteers in an animal shelter in her community. She gives a lot of her time to those rescue efforts. And so my advice is just go with your passion. You generally won't go wrong because it's really frustrating in life to have this passion for something and that you just don't get involved in or you just don't invest in. You go with what God's passionate for. You go with your passion, <clears throat> excuse me, your passion for, and you generally be exactly where God wants you to be. Here's a third thing that you can uh, ask yourself. What unique talents, abilities, or gifts do I have that can be used to bless the kingdom of God? What talents and abilities do I have? Once upon a time, there were some animals, and these animals wanted to start a school. And so they decided the courses in this school would include running and climbing and swimming and flying. Well, then they decided that all of the animals should take all of the courses so they would be well-rounded animals. But that's where the problem started. The duck, for example, he was really, really good at swimming. In fact, the duck was really better than his teacher was at swimming. But he only made passing grades in flying, and he was very, very poor in running. And so they made the duck stay after school to practice running. Well, this caused his webbed feet to be badly worn and his grade dropped to very average in swimming. But everybody else felt less threatened and more comfortable with all of this except the duck. Well, the rabbit, he started at the top of his class in running. But because he had so much makeup work to do in swimming, he caught pneumonia and he had to drop out of school. The squirrel showed up. He showed outstanding ability in climbing, 
But he was extremely frustrated in flying class because the teacher insisted that he start from the ground up rather than from the treetop down. And he developed Charlie horses from overextension. And so he only got a C in climbing and a D in running. The eagle, now the eagle was the problem student. The eagle was disciplined for being a nonconformist. For instance, in climbing class, he beat all the others to the top of the tree, but he insisted on using his own way to get there by flying to the top. Finally, because he refused to participate in swimming class, the eagle was expelled. Now, what's the point of this story for you and me? Well, God has designed specific animals to excel in specific areas, and he doesn't expect them to do all the other things. A duck is made to be a duck and not something else. People are the same way. When you expect every person to have the same abilities and gifts and do the same things, you're going to get frustrated and you're going to get mediocrity and you're going to get failure. See, you were made to be you and no one else. God has given you unique abilities and he wants you to use them for his purposes. You know, if I had not gone into full-time ministry, I likely would have become an accountant. I really enjoy doing things that revolve around money and keeping financial records. So when I was part of the birth of Mission Fuel, our mission organization for India, I volunteered to be the treasurer of the new organization. And I did that for four years until uh, the mission ministry grew enough where we needed to hire a bookkeeper. But I still volunteer as the chief financial officer and the vice president of the organization. Now, I've never aspired to be the president of Mission Fuel because our president is a retired Apple executive who worked in business and product development. He has this amazing mind and ability to develop organizations, something I could never do. We've led well Mission Fuel together well, because we're both working in our own areas of giftedness. And we're all uniquely talented. And we're all gifted in a special way. We all have certain interests and abilities and a unique personality. So we flourish in specific ministries and specific tasks that God calls us to be involved in that align with the way he has gifted us. You know, every Friday... Sherry Taylor comes here and vacuums this whole worship center and the circular hallway all around this room. Her husband, Roger, did this with her until he had a stroke two months ago. I don't know if Sherry would say that she has the gift of vacuuming, but it is something that she enjoys and it's needed here. And she's been doing it for well over a year now. And if I didn't mention this, most of you wouldn't know that. You come in and you see the clean floors on Sunday and, and that makes you happy. Many of you might not even know who Sherry Taylor is. But she plays a very important role in our church. And this leads to a fourth question to ask. What needs are there in your community, in your church, in your organization that you could meet? You know, sometimes we just need to do what needs to be done. Just do what needs to be done. I recall years back when we announced a need for preschool teachers. And there was this couple who was around 70 at the time. And they volunteered to serve in our preschool ministry. Now, I wasn't expecting a 70-year-old couple to want to work teaching three- and four-year-old kids. And so I asked them, are you sure that you want to do this? And I remember Bill's answer. It's not about whether we want to do this or not. It's about a need the church has that we are able to meet. Bill and his wife, Judy, then served in our preschool department for, I don't know, perhaps four or five years. And they were beloved by all the kids and their parents. And they had a tremendous impact on the kids and the family that were part of our preschool department simply because they didn't make it about what they wanted to do. They simply responded to a need that was made known. One night, a man by the name of George Phillips of Meridian, Mississippi, he and his wife were getting ready for bed. 
And the wife looked out the bedroom window and she noticed the light was on in the garden shed out in the backyard. Evidently, some thieves had broken in and were trying to steal some of their tools. And so she told George to call the police and he did. When the dispatcher learned the details of the call, the reply was, well, all of our people are busy right now, but someone will get there as soon as possible. So George hung up the phone, waited about 30 seconds, called the police again. He said, hey, I'm the guy who called a few seconds ago about the thieves breaking into my tool shed. Don't worry about it. I've taken care of it. I just shot all of them. Well, within a couple of minutes, there were three squad cars, an ambulance, and emergency rescue vehicles. The cops caught the burglars red-handed. And one of the policemen said to George, I thought you said you shot them. And George replied, I thought you said nobody was available. <laughs> nobody available. You know, that is a phrase that should never, ever be used or heard in the kingdom of God. God's intention is that his children will always be available to serve others. Yet church after church after church, including First Christian Church, and especially in this post-COVID world, we struggle mightily recruiting and retaining volunteers. So look for and listen for needs in your community, in your church, in your kid's school, in, a, in an HOA. Consider getting involved just because there's a need there and you could be the person to meet that need. I appreciate the dozen or so people who recently volunteered for our new cafe monitor position. Now, I am grateful for those of you who stepped up to the plate. And for John, who's back there right now, hi, John, thank you. Admittedly, I was actually surprised by a few names on the list of volunteers. I thought to myself, they volunteered for this? Wow, that's cool. I wouldn't have ever guessed they would have volunteered for this. So thank you to each of you for being the people willing to get involved, willing to meet a need that was simply presented to you. And so what needs are there? that you can meet. Here's a fifth question you should ask yourself when trying to figure this all out. What do other people encourage you to do? What does other people encourage you to do? God will often call us to our role in his plan through the counsel and the encouragement of other godly people. Four or five years ago, when Mike and Amanda DeAmbro started coming to church here, we learned that he played guitar. We said, Mike, it'd be really cool for you to play guitar on our worship team. And he wasn't really excited. I said, I haven't played in a long time. I don't think that I could do it. And then through Greg's encouragement, uh, Mike said, okay, I'll come over and I'll just strum with you guys in rehearsal. Eventually, Mike landed right back here, kind of hiding, but he was playing. Eventually, I said, Mike, you're really, really good. You ought to, you ought to sing sometime and, and help with vocals. We could, we could set you right here with a microphone. And Mike was like, nah, I don't think so. And I said that a few more times, and eventually we actually got Mike, and, we, and, and me and Greg kind of just pushed him and pulled him, and, and we got Mike right here, and, and he was vocals. And I remember sometimes I said, hey, Mike, one day you should lead worship for us. Mike said, oh, I can't do that. I'm not that good of a singer. I, I don't think I can do that. And I said, okay. And then I suggested it again and again, and then the need came up. Mike stepped up to the plate, and now he's regularly subs in for Tyka. See, it's all about what others encourage you to do. This past week, I was visiting with Jane Jameson, one of our senior adults, and she was recalling a time many years ago when two ladies from here at FCC, their husbands were both elders here at the time, Barbara Feaster and Betty Watwood. And they invited her to take on the leadership of the lady circle. Jane told me she never thought of herself as a leader in a position like that. But, but she greatly respected these two ladies who challenged her, who encouraged her. And she took on the position. She served effectively for several years in that role. See, often other people will see gifts and talents and passions in you that you don't see in yourself. Sometimes we just have to listen to the encouragement and the counsel of others because they may be the means that God is calling you to a specific role to play in his plan. 
For a few years now, I've been encouraging Sarah Downs from our church to take on a leadership role in our children's ministry. Sarah might tell you that I have hounded her for the last couple of years. I think it's been encouragement though. But either way, she agreed this past December to take on leading the Kids Life Ministry, and she is doing an amazing job with it. Sometimes it's best for us to just listen to what others are encouraging us to do and become involved in, because God will often speak to other people. So what do other people encourage us to? Finally, number six, what have been my life experiences. What have been my life experiences? You know, we are all in this place together, but we certainly haven't gotten here in the same ways. The experiences you have in life that I haven't had uniquely position you to serve the plans of God in ways that I would never be effective serving. If you're a widow, you can minister to new widows much better than me. If you've overcome drug or alcohol dependency, you can minister to those struggling with addiction way better than I can ever. So what life experiences have you had that position you to effectively minister to people who are presently experiencing the same things that you've experienced? I have a cousin who is a breast cancer survivor. Over the past 10 years, she has helped countless women who have been diagnosed with breast cancer. And she's helped them navigate the tricky and the treacherous waters of a breast cancer diagnosis. Now, none of these six questions should be answered separately from the others. Because God uses multiple means to call his people to their specific role in his plan. But by reflecting on each of these questions, you'll be better equipped to identify more accurately where God is calling you to invest your life and the role that he wants you to play in his kingdom. I want to close with the words of the Apostle Paul, words that he wrote to the Corinthian church. The words will be on the screen. Paul wrote these words in a means of kind of correcting some behaviors that were taking place, some division that was taking place in the Corinthian church. He said, when one of you says that I'm a follower of Paul and another says, well, I follow Apollos, aren't you just acting like people of the world? After all, who is Apollos? Who is Paul? I mean, we're only God's servants through whom you believe the good news. Each of us did the work the Lord gave us. I planted the seed in your hearts. Apollos watered it, but it was God who made it grow. So the one who plants and the one who waters, they work together with the same purpose and both will be rewarded for their hard work. For we are both God's workers. Now I want you to catch this, the, the tone of this. Paul says, we are only God's servants who do the work the Lord gave us. That's all that God ever wants us to be, expects us to be. That's all we need to be, is simply God's servants who do the work the Lord gave us. It's all we want to be. It's all God calls us to be. And so as we stand in the gap of this great divide in America, we need each of us to simply identify what God has called us, identify the work God has called us to, and to get to doing it. See, what you do is never more important than the purpose for which you do it and the one for whom you do it for. Simply be God's servant who does the work he has given you. Let us all work together with the same purpose. And don't wait for an invitation to get involved. You don't need an invitation. I love it when someone comes to me and says, you know, I'd like our church to be doing this and I am willing to lead this effort. Or someone comes to me and says, 
I want to serve. Tell me where. You don't have to be anything more than God's servant doing the work that God has called you. But what I can tell you is that if you are simply a spectator or simply a consumer, that's not where God wants you. God is not looking for consumers and spectators. God is looking for contributors. God is looking for participants. And so if you can identify a place where you contribute and where you participate in the life of our church, that's a problem. It's not what God wants. God is seeking people who will contribute and people who will participate. He doesn't have a whole lot of need for spectators and consumers. And so you think about this week, where does God want you to serve? What role does God want you to play in his kingdom? And if you need help figuring that out, call me, we'll get together. I'll let you buy me lunch and we'll talk about it. <laughs> oh, all can aside, you need to figure this out because that's where God wants you. That's how you're in the will of God. That's how you play the role that God has called you to play. Let's stand. I'm going to pray and then we're going to sing together. Father God in heaven, thank you for uh, the challenge of this day, the challenge, God, to be exactly who you have called us to be, to play the role exactly that you have called us to play. God, you give us our minds to help us figure these things out. And so, Father, I pray that the questions we brought up today and the things we talked about will just help each of us to figure out in a more specific way where it is you want us to serve you. We thank you and we love you for inviting us into your presence this day. And we pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen.